How's it going, folks? Welcome to my second discussion video. Now let's get into it. Today, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, commonly called North Korea, is a name synonymous with oppression, a cult of personality, paranoia, and despair. But this nation was not born in a vacuum. Modern North Korea arose from the ashes of World War II. After centuries of independence, in 1910, Korea fell under Japanese rule. Speaking Korean was banned, Koreans were forced to take Japanese names and swear fealty to the Emperor of Japan, and Korean men and women were enslaved by the Japanese. Any protests against Japanese rule were brutally put down. Various resistance movements emerged to fight the Japanese, including the Korean guerrillas in Manchuria, the Korean Republicans in Shanghai, the Korean Communist Party, and the Korean Christian Resistance. After the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Empire of Japan surrendered on August 15, 1945. After the Japanese surrender, a new provisional government, the People's Republic of Korea, or PRK for short, was formed. The PRK featured some of the most famous Korean independence activists within its government. But on August 10, 1945, the United States and the Soviet Union agreed to divide Korea along the 38th parallel, with the Soviet Union occupying the North on August 14, 1945, while the United States occupied South Korea a few weeks later on September 8, 1945. The American occupation authorities outlawed the Southern PRK government to make room for the proto-state of South Korea on December 12, 1945, while the Soviet occupiers assimilated the Northern PRK government into the proto-state of North Korea on February 8, 1946. Following the division of Korea, many of the well-known independence activists began to die or disappear, including provisional PRK leader Yo Eun Hyung, assassinated in the South in 1947, Cho Man Sik, regional northern leader, disappeared in the North in 1946, and Kim Gu, assassinated in the South in 1949. As the founders of the defunct PRK died off in the North, an officer of the Red Army, Kim Il-sung, was chosen by the Soviet Union to become the leader of an independent communist North Korea in 1948. That same year, the United States put an elderly independence activist, Lee Sung Man, known in English as Sing Man Ri, into power as the first president of an independent anti-communist South Korea. Both men ruled their nations as dictators. On June 25, 1950, Kim Il-sung invaded the South, starting the Korean War, only for it to end three years later with millions of Koreans dead and no real change. After the war, Kim Il-sung would go on to rule North Korea, worshipped by his people as a godlike figure, for the next 45 years with an iron fist before dying at age 82 in 1994, leaving behind a starving, totalitarian state for his son and later grandson to rule into the modern day. Lee Sung-man ruled South Korea with an iron fist until his government was toppled by protests in 1960. However, his decision to rule South Korea as a dictator from the outset meant that democracy would have to wait four decades before it could finally blossom in South Korea. In 1961, General Park Chung-hee took power in a military coup and then led South Korea as its dictator. Park's rule was defined by economic prosperity and zero tolerance for dissent and continued until he was assassinated in 1979. His successor, Choi gyu ha was then overthrown in 1980 by General Chun doo hwan who ruled the South as its last and most hated dictator until the long-awaited emergence of South Korean democracy in 1988. However, there were attempts to bring democracy to South Korea before the 1980s. A key figure in the early South Korean democracy movement against Lee sung mans dictatorship was Cho Bong-am. Cho Bong-am was born in the city of Incheon, Korea, on September 25, 1898. After dropping out of school due to extreme poverty, Cho Bong Am became a civil servant in 1913. After leaving that position, he changed jobs frequently throughout the 1910s, eventually ending up studying at a YMCA in Seoul by spring 1919. It was here he first met Pak Hon Yong, who would go on to help found the Korean Communist Party, and Lee Sung Man, who would go on to be the first president of South Korea. It was also during this time that Cho Bong Am participated in the March 1st movement, wherein Koreans protested against Japanese rule, only for the Japanese to launch a brutal crackdown on dissent and crush the protests. After this, Cho Bong Am fled to Shanghai, China, where he joined the Korean government in exile. It was here that he reunited with his old friend Pak Hon Yong. However, Cho Bong Am soon became disenchanted with the Korean government in exile, as it was plagued by constant infighting, and, in 1921, he joined the Korean Communist Movement in Shanghai, going on to participate in and coordinate with communist groups in the Soviet Union, Korea, and Manchuria, before quitting politics and being arrested by the Japanese in the early 1930s. Cho Bong Am spent years in solitary confinement during this time, and was subjected to torture by the Japanese authorities. 
Cho Bang Am was finally released from his imprisonment by the Japanese on August 15, 1945, Liberation Day. Cho Bong Am attempted to re-enter communist politics after his imprisonment, but found himself opposed to the communist movement's current trajectory, and his friendship with Pak Hon Yong was destroyed in the process. Pak Hon Yong declared Cho Bong Am a counter-revolutionary, while Cho Bong Am criticized the communist party's dictatorial nature and subservience to the authorities in Moscow. Cho Bong Am then left the communist party and renounced communism for good in May 1946. He was condemned as a traitor by the communists of Korea. Cho Bong Am then fled to anti-communist South Korea in fear of his life. Sadly, the anti-communist politicians of the South treated the newly anti-communist Cho Bong Am with suspicion, with many believing he was still a communist. After re-entering politics in South Korea, he faced many attempts on his life, spending many days in safe houses. In July 1948, President Lee Sung Man approached Cho Bong Am with an offer to join his cabinet as the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry, promising to enact Cho's land reforms. Cho reluctantly agreed to join Lee Sung Man's government on August 15, 1948, although he left the post and returned to politics just a few months later in February of the following year. Many of Cho Bong Am's land policies from when he was Minister of Agriculture and Forestry would later be adopted by President Park Chung Hee, with many considering Cho as having laid the groundwork for Park's success. In early 1950, Cho Bong Am was elected vice chairman of the National Assembly of South Korea. When North Korea invaded the South on June 25, 1950, Cho Bong Am and the other leaders of the National Assembly quickly went to meet with President Lee Sung Man to coordinate a plan of action, only to find that he had already fled Seoul, despite saying he wouldn't. Panic engulfed South Korea as the military was very weak at the time and couldn't hold back the North for long. Seoul would soon fall. Much of the remaining leadership in Seoul followed Lee Sung Man's lead and also fled for their lives, abandoning the people of Seoul. As leaders of South Korea abandoned the people, Cho Bang Am stepped up and got to work. Cho Bang Am organized a coordinated orderly evacuation of Seoul, staying as long as he could to maintain order in the doomed Korean capital. Cho Bong Am also went out of his way to destroy sensitive documents to keep them from falling into the hands of the communists and endangering more lives. In his effort to maintain order as long as he could, he endangered himself. His wife never made it out of Seoul and was killed by the communists. Cho Bong Am himself finally made his retreat from Seoul, rescuing the staff of several other lawmakers along the way. When Cho Bong Am made his way farther south, and Lee Sung Man learned of Cho's actions, he cynically remarked that Cho Bong Am must have left Seoul after finishing his meeting with his communist bosses. Indeed, Lee Sung Man began to feel very threatened by Cho Bong Am and treated him very poorly, convinced he was a communist despite him putting his life in danger to save the people of Seoul from the communists. After North Korea took over Seoul, they put up posters saying if the traitor Cho Bong Am is arrested, he will be killed. In 1952, President Lee Sung Man announced that he would run for re-election, and Cho decided to run against him as there was, in Cho's words, no other candidate for the people. Cho Bong Am lost to Lee Sung Man in 1952, in an election marked by the Korean War and political violence. After the Korean War's end, Cho Bong Am went in front of a governmental meeting with Lee Sung Man and demanded that President Lee Sung Man apologize for violating his promise to remain and defend Seoul. Lee Sung Man simply insulted Cho and refused to apologize. In 1956, Cho Bong Am ran against Lee Sung Man again as a member of his newly created Progressive Party. This time, Cho Bong Am won 30% of the vote in an election widely considered fraudulent. That is to say, so many people voted for Cho Bong Am that they had to raise his fake number of votes from 5 or 10% to 30%. If the number was too low, everyone would realize that the election was rigged. It makes one think how many votes Cho Bong Am actually got. After Cho Bong Am's strong showing in the 1956 election, Lee Sung Man decided to get rid of him once and for all. At dawn on January 12, 1958, the Seoul Metropolitan Police Department declared a state of emergency and began to arrest all the members of Cho's progressive party. Cho Bong Am himself managed to escape this roundup but refused to go into exile despite his friends and family's pleas, saying that he was committed to staying in South Korea. Near the end of January 1958, Cho Bong Am was taken into custody, charged with espionage for North Korea, and sentenced to death by hanging. Cho Bong Am spent the last months of his life at Seo Daimun Prison in Seoul. The resulting public outcry came from all across South Korea, as almost no one believed that the false allegations were true, and many petitions were made to save Cho Bong Am's life, but to no avail. Furthermore, even the United States of America urged Lee Sung Man to spare Cho Bong Am's life, yet Lee Sung Man refused to listen to all of them. Cho Bong Am was to pay for his democratic ideals with his life. The crime? having challenged Lee Sung Man's dictatorship.
Regarding his last months of life at Seo Daimun Prison, one former prisoner recalled of Cho Bong Am that, in the last days of his life, Mr. Cho befriended the birds who visited his prison cell's window, feeding them daily. One hot summer day, Mr. Cho, who had always remembered to feed these birds, left for his execution, and when the birds kept coming despite him being gone, they began to mourn the man who greeted and loved them. Prisoners said that soon after his death, birds began to congregate at the site of Cho's execution, mourning their lost friend. Cho Bong Am was executed by hanging at 11.03 a.m. on July 31, 1959 at Seo Daimun Prison in Seoul, South Korea. He was 60 years old. In 2011, his death sentence was posthumously overturned by the Supreme Court of South Korea. Since the turmoil of the 20th century, South Korea has become a first world democracy with an incredibly strong economy and a culture that's popular across the globe. Today there are two Koreas, one totalitarian and one democratic, and they remain divided. But there was a moment in time where the history of modern Korea could have been drastically changed. What would Korea be like today if the Korean War had never happened? The question that begins this alternate history of what if the Korean War never happened has to be what if Kim Il-sung, the eternal leader of North Korea, had never taken power as he was the main catalyst behind the war. In the early months of North Korea's history in 1945, it was a hotbed of anti-communist opposition and political turmoil. The regional leader of the North under the PRK, Cho Man-sik, was originally viewed by the Soviet Union as the best candidate for the leader of North Korea. However, Cho was a Christian, a pacifist, and opposed to the division of Korea, which led to the Soviets arresting and disappearing him in early 1946, so a more devout communist could take his place, leading to the Soviets choosing communist soldier Kim Il-sung to lead the North. During one of North Korea's first military parades on March 1, 1946, an 18-year-old anti-communist threw a hand grenade at the stage while Kim Il-sung was giving a speech. A Soviet advisor to Kim, Yakov Novichenko, threw himself on top of the grenade, losing his arm in the process. But... Kim Il-sung was saved. This incident will serve as the point of divergence in our story. What if the grenade had been aimed slightly better and the Soviet advisor had reacted just a little bit slower? Our alternate history begins on that fateful day of March 1st, 1946. The explosion rings out and engulfs the podium where Supreme Leader of North Korea, Kim Il-sung, had just been giving a speech. Yakov Novichenko, Kim's Soviet advisor, had rushed to save Kim but was just a few seconds too late. Kim Il-sung himself lay dying on the podium, mortally wounded by the blast. Just a few minutes later, Kim Il-sung dies, aged 34 years old. Kim Il-sung's assassin has only seconds to celebrate his victorious kill before he is ripped to pieces by the furious spectators. The Soviets are very much disappointed with this outcome. North Korea itself falls into chaos after Kim's assassination, with the Soviet Union having to send in the Red Army to restore order to the region. In the chaos following Kim Il-sung's assassination, the few remaining activists within the underground anti-communist Christian churches of North Korea stage a daring breakout of their leader, Cho Man-sik, from a North Korean prison camp. On March 3, 1946, Cho Man-sik and his followers flee to South Korea and settle in Seoul for the time being. On March 11, 1946, the Soviet Union re-establishes order in North Korea, and Pak kon yong one of the founders of the Korean Communist Party, becomes the new supreme leader of North Korea. Plans for a future invasion of the South are abandoned by North Korea, as Kim Il-sung was the main proponent for an invasion. Pak Hon yong is certain that an invasion is pointless and will only serve to bolster Lee sung mans rule in the South. Following this logic, Pak Hon yong decides that the best course of action is to let the South destroy itself under Lee sung mans despotic rule. Supreme Leader Pak then moves to consolidate power in the aftermath of the charismatic Kim Il-sung's demise. Coming from the native Korean communist faction, Pak then gains the allegiance of the Soviet Korean and Chinese Korean factions respectively, but Kim Il-sung's guerrilla faction resists Pak's rule. A rumor begins to spread that Pak himself was behind the assassination of Kim Il-sung, which, although untrue, results in the guerrilla faction rebelling against Pak and his rule being significantly weaker than Kim's was in our timeline. Minor guerrilla resistance to Supreme Leader Pak continued sporadically for the next few years until their final defeat in 1951. In 1948, North Korea gains independence from Soviet administration with Pak Hon yong at the helm as supreme leader. Likewise, a few days later, South Korea gains independence from the American administration with Lee sung man at the helm as president and his ally Kim sung so as vice president. The South has more or less followed an identical path as in our timeline in this alternate history, at least up to 1948. However, the changes in the South that make it drastically different from our timeline lie in two key factors the survival of many of the original Korean independence leaders, and the absence of a Korean war. 
Firstly, many of the legendary Korean independence activists are never killed in the South as a result of the North being engulfed in chaos. Yo Eun Hyung, who in our timeline was assassinated in 1947 by a North Korean refugee, survives as his would-be assassin is accidentally killed in the brief anarchy following Kim's assassination. Kim Gu, a revered figure amongst many Koreans, killed by an agent of Lee Sung-man in 1949, is still attacked and shot, but survives these injuries, ending up in a coma for two years. Cho Man Sik makes his new home in the South after escaping certain death in the North. Founding a new political party opposed to Lee Sung Man's Liberal Party, Cho Man Sik christens this party the Korean Social Democratic Party and then enters South Korean politics. In 1950, Cho Man Sik has a chance encounter in the National Assembly with Vice Chairman of the National Assembly Cho Bong Am, a former communist turned anti communist left wing politician. Both men are dissatisfied with Lee Sung Man's abysmally corrupt government and they bond over this. Soon, Cho Man Sik and Cho Bong Am become political allies, colloquially known as the Joklik. While the North begins to stabilize under Pak Hon Yong's rule, the South remains incredibly unstable, much like in our timeline. Following the Jeju Uprising and the Bodo League Massacre in winter 1950, Lee Sung Man's hold on power wanes severely. The vast majority of the South Korean populace is against his continued rule, and without the distraction of a communist invasion, the blame for all of South Korea's problems is squarely focused on President Lee Sung Man. As his popularity craters, Lee Sung Man takes increasingly authoritarian measures, which only exacerbate the situation in South Korea further. Alarmed by these developments, Cho Man Sik grows increasingly worried that the despotic, far right rule of Lee Sung Man will cause the communists of the North to gain support in the South more so than they already have. So, in 1951, Cho Man-sik announces that he and Cho Bong am will form a ticket for the 1952 South Korean presidential campaign. Cho Man-sik will be the candidate for president, while Cho Bong am will stand for vice president. Lee Sung man begins plotting to assassinate both members of the Cho clique. However, on June 26th, 1951, two years exactly after the attempt on his life, Kim Gu awakens in a hospital in Seoul. Within six months, Kim Gu has recovered enough to walk and speak. He gives an incendiary press conference on January 1st, 1952, in which he incriminates President Lee Sung Man in the attempt on his life. Kim Gu also endorses Cho Man Sik's run for the presidency, while reluctantly also endorsing Cho Bong Am, as the two men never saw eye to eye. Kim Gu's shocking revelations are the final nail in the coffin for Lee Sung Man. His last resort was to declare martial law, accuse the Cho of being communists, and execute them. However, two of the most important figures in the military align themselves with the Cho clique. Paik Son Yop, a very influential colonel in the South Korean military, lambasts Lee Sung Man's actions as, unfortunately for Lee Sung Man, Paik Son Yop was an aide to Kim Gu for a short time and the two became close friends as a result. Knowing that Lee Sung Man was behind the attempt on Kim Gu's life is enough for Paik Son Yop to break publicly with him. However, because of the delicate situation in South Korea at the time, Pike Son Yop does not whip the military into open rebellion, but simply announces that the military will remain neutral in the 1952 presidential election. At Pike's side is his good friend, a charismatic officer in the South Korean army named Park Chung Hee. Formerly a communist himself, having participated in the Yeosu Sun Chon communist rebellion, Park Chung Hee relates to Cho Bong Am's vision for an anti communist center left South Korea, oriented towards social reform and progress. Facing an imminent political downfall, President Lee Sung Man calls for a U.S. intervention in South Korea. However, to his shock, the United States declines to aid him. The United States also has a presidential election in 1952, and U.S. President Harry Truman, who, without the Korean War, has a much better chance of re-election than in our timeline, does not wish to deploy any troops overseas just before the election. Election Day arrives, and on August 5th, 1952, Cho Man Sik and Cho Bong Am win the presidential elections in a landslide. Cho Bong Am's message of radical social change and anti communism is tempered by Cho Man Sik's image of a wise Christian elder winning over voters from across the political spectrum. Lee Sung Man goes into exile in Hawaii following Cho Man Sik's inauguration on August 15, 1952, dying in Honolulu in 1970. Because of his advanced age, Cho Man Sik essentially serves as a figurehead while Cho Bong Am runs the country day to day. This was mutually agreed to, and both the president and vice president are pleased with this arrangement. Although Cho Bong Am had previously supported peaceful reunification with the North, Cho Man Sik works tirelessly to nip this thinking in the bud. 
President Cho Man Sik relays to his good friend, Vice President Cho Bong Am, the horrible human rights conditions in the North, which he personally experienced during his imprisonment there in 1946. Furthermore, Cho Man Sik cautions Cho Bong Am that the United States, already wary of a center left leader running South Korea, will overthrow him if he is viewed as friendly with the North, putting his plans for national rejuvenation into jeopardy. One final impediment to reunification with the North is that, as a result of Cho Bong Am leaving the communist movement, Supreme Leader Pak refuses to have a dialogue with him. With a heavy heart, Cho Bong Am puts to rest any ideas of reunification for the time being and sets his sights on improving life for the people of South Korea. And without the devastation of the Korean War, this is far easier than in our timeline. Signing a mutual defense treaty with the United States in 1954, Vice President Cho Bong Am has his nation's security situation stabilized. Cho then embarks on an ambitious program of industrialization and social reform, including free health care, land reform, free education, poverty elimination efforts, alongside the promotion of democratic values in South Korea. By 1956, South Korea's economy is booming as a result of Cho Bong Am's economic policies, in some ways similar to Park Chung Hee's in our timeline. Cho Man Sik and Cho Bong Am are handily re elected. During this time, their political ally, Park Chung-hee, reaches the rank of general in the South Korean army and works to quell anti-Cho dissent in the military, while Speaker of the National Assembly, Yo eun hyung and Deputy Speaker, Jang tae sang having re-entered politics following Lee sung mans downfall in 1952, join the Cho clique and ensures that their agenda is wholly supported by the National Assembly, as well as maintaining a Big Ten coalition to keep the left-wing and right-wing factions of Korea in support of the overall good of the nation. In 1960, President Cho Man Sik reaches his term limit and commits to a peaceful transfer of power to his elected successor. On March 15, 1960, Cho Bong Am easily wins the election against his opponent, Yi Bom Sok. President Cho Bong Am is sworn in as the third president of the Republic of Korea on March 25, 1960. Already having virtually ruled the country for eight years, President Cho gains another eight years to cement his legacy as a champion of democracy and anti-communism in South Korea. On September 11, 1964, President Cho Bong Am authorizes sending the armed forces of the Republic of Korea to fight in South Vietnam, and names General Park Chung-hee as Supreme Commander of Korean forces in Vietnam. South Korean troops will remain in Vietnam until their withdrawal in 1967. In exchange for deploying troops to Vietnam, the United States supplies Cho's government with generous economic aid. After reaching his term limit and leaving office in 1968, President Cho Bong Am settles down for a quiet life in Seoul. However, he often makes public appearances to great jubilation from his supporters, most famously at the funeral of his mentor and friend, President Cho Man Sik, in 1970. In 1967, General Park Chung-hee returns from Vietnam and quickly becomes a prominent figure within the Korean Social Democratic Party. He runs for president in 1968 and wins, taking office that year in a peaceful transfer of power. Park Chung-hee's political views are aligned with the Cho Click in this timeline, and he is never a dictator. After serving two terms, Park Chung-hee is succeeded by Choi Gyu-ha in 1976, and Choi Gyu-ha is, in turn, succeeded by Kim Dae-jung in 1984. Meanwhile, North Korea has had a very different journey across the latter half of the 20th century. Pak Hon-yong leads a communist regime that, while accomplishing some important reforms, remains authoritarian. To make matters worse, the border between the two Koreas is much more porous than in our timeline. There is no DMZ. Thus, knowledge of South Korea's democracy and thriving economy causes massive instability and undermines Pak Hon Yong's rule. Supreme Leader Pak is regularly forced to call on the Red Army to put down anti communist uprisings, including in 1954, 1968, and 1979. This last uprising in 1979 takes a great toll on the aging leader's health. On June 23, 1980, Supreme Leader Pak of North Korea dies, and North Korea proclaims five days of mourning. Supreme Leader Pak is succeeded by his political heir and protege, Jang Song Taek. Supreme Leader Jang emerges as a pragmatic reformist willing to hold talks with the South regarding the warming of relations. However, in late 1987, the Soviet Union, already facing an insurmountable crisis of its own, cuts off aid from North Korea, and the Chinese are only able to supply enough food and economic aid for two years before poor harvests force them to also cease giving aid. In 1989, North Korea faces an imminent famine as a result of poorly run state farms, bad soil, flooding, and a sheer lack of arable land. In November 1989, Supreme Leader Jong approaches President Kim Dae-jung of the South with the possibility of immediate reunification to avert a catastrophic famine in the North, citing recent developments in contemporary Germany. President Kim Dae-jung agrees to the North's unconditional surrender and admittance to the South. 
Korea is de facto reunified in 1989, and de jure reunified on August 15, 1990, after 45 years of separation. Henceforth, Liberation Day is renamed National Day. Although reunification tanks the South's economy, the North never suffers a famine in the 1990s like it did in our timeline. The abundance of untapped northern mineral reserves causes the Unified Republic of Korea to recover at a steady rate, and Unified Korea's economy is mostly recovered by the mid-2000s. Before we come to the end of our story, let's check up on the fates of the various important figures of Korea in the 20th century, whose lives are very much altered in this alternate timeline. Regarding the Kim Dynasty, Kim Jong-il, long relegated to the periphery of the North Korean elite by Supreme Leader Pak, who viewed him as a threat to his power, becomes a minor celebrity amongst fans of his late father after reunification. In our timeline, Kim Jong-il was a big fan of movies and actually even made a few. In this alternate timeline, he also becomes a film director, but is mainly relegated to small productions. After he is turned around by multiple studios, who find his work wooden and boring, he is eventually arrested after continually harassing famous director Shin Sang-ok, and spends a few months in jail. Kim Jong-il dies in 2003 of a heart attack. His only son, Kim Jong-nam, leads a playboy lifestyle, but eventually settles down with his family in Pyongyang. In 2016, Kim Jong-nam is elected as Pyongyang's representative to the National Assembly. Park Chung-hee becomes a national celebrity for his service to the nation and is frequently consulted for advice by later Korean presidents before his death from lung cancer in 1995. Kim Gu makes a full recovery following his awakening from the coma in 1952 and goes on to live out his remaining years in peace, publishing numerous poems about reunification in Korea before dying peacefully at his home in 1961. Yo Eun Hyung enjoys a long career as Speaker of the National Assembly, remaining a steadfast proponent of unification until his death in 1964. Lastly, Cho Bong Am, widely considered the father of reunified Korea, remains immensely popular across Korea. An elderly Cho leads the reunification ceremony, broadcast worldwide with the people of Korea glued to their screens. Cho Bong Am dedicates his reunification speech to all of the Koreans who gave their lives for the independence and reunification of Korea. President Cho Bong Am dies on New Year's Day 1999 at the age of 100 at his home in Seoul, the capital of the reunified Republic of Korea. By 2022, Korea is the fifth largest economy in the world and the most powerful country in Asia. Every August 15th, National Day celebrations are a massive occasion that sees Korea, from Mount Paektu to Jeju Island, lit up with fireworks and jubilant celebrations across the land of the morning calm. Korea's National Assembly stands silent amidst the celebrations. In front of the heart of Korean democracy, there stands a large statue of the various Korean independence fighters. Chol Man Sik, Kim Gu, Yo Eun Hyung, An Jung Gun, among various others. In the middle stands a statue of President Cho Bong Am smiling happily and waving to onlookers. The statues are illuminated by the fireworks in the night sky. The men they are dedicated to rest easy, knowing that their Korea is at last truly free.